This video is about looking at changes in entropy as systems go through physical and chemical processes. There are several different ways that we can look, and look at and calculate changes in entropy. As you can see from the equation on this slide, this is very similar to a couple of other ones that we've seen already, um, where you have the change in the entropy of a system is equal to the summation of the entropies of the products minus the summation of the entro entropies of the reactants. So this is the first method that I want to talk to you about. We're going to look at two systems and what we're going to do here is we're first going to use our prediction guidelines to determine if the change in entropy is going to be positive or negative. If the change in entropy is positive, that means entropy increases as the process moves forward. If the change in entropy is negative, that means the entropy decreases as the process moves forward. So let's take a look at our first system, which is the evaporation of one mole of liquid ethanol to ethanol vapor. So in an evaporation, what we're doing is changing a liquid to a gas. So if you look at the guidelines, as we lined out in the last video and in we worked on in the packets, when you change the state of a substance, as you go from solid to liquid to gas, you have more disorder. And so when you're evaporating a substance and going from a liquid to a gas, you would expect the entropy to increase. And so in this case, the change in entropy is going to be greater than zero or positive. Simply because you're changing a substance, a single substance, from a liquid to a gas. Let's take a look at our se second system. This is a combustion reaction. And we have all gases here. So when we have all gases, what we have to do is we have to look at the change in the moles of gases from the reactant to the product. And here we have a one, one mole, and three moles. So here on the reactant side, we have four moles of gas, and then we have two moles and three moles. So on the product side, we have five moles of gas. So we've increased the number of gas molecules in our chemical system by converting the reactants into products. If we increase the number of gas moles, this is another guideline that tells us that the change in entropy of this system is also going to be greater than zero or positive. So let's now see if our calculations, based on the equation on the previous slide, bear these predictions out. Here is our first one at the top of the slide, evaporating ethanol. And what we do here is we can look up the values for the entropies in Appendix L in the back of our book, or of course in a quiz or a test, these entropy values would be given to you. So we're going to use the change in entropy of the system is equal to the summation of the standard entropies of the products minus the summation of the standard entropies of the reactants. And in this case, we only have one product and one reactant, and so it becomes a very simple mathematical operation. And the standard entropy of the gaseous ethanol, which is the product, is 282.7 joules per kelvin mole, and the liquid ethanol is 160.7 joules per kelvin mole. And all we need to do is simply subtract those two, and indeed we get a positive number. We get a positive 122, and this is joules per kelvin. Notice that we take each of those entropy values and we multiply them by the mole amounts because those entropy values are joules per kelvin per mole. So anytime you have a coefficient in a chemical reaction, as we do in the second example, you need to multiply that entropy by the coefficient. So we predicted that converting the liquid to the gas would be a positive entropy change, and indeed it is a positive entropy change when we do the calculation. Let's take a look at the second reaction, which is ethanol vapor being converted into carbon dioxide and water. We can call this the oxidation of ethanol vapor. Now we do have coefficients in this chemical reaction. Coefficient for carbon dioxide was 2, water was 3, 
ethanol was 1 and oxygen was 3. So we need to multiply our entropy values by those coefficients. And so we set up our products, carbon dioxide and water, minus our reactants, ethanol and oxygen. So carbon dioxide's entropy is 213.74. We multiply that by 2. Uh, uh, water's entropy is 188.84. We multiply that one by 3. And then we subtract from that ethanol's, which is 282.7. Please note that that's gaseous ethanol, and you do need to pay attention to the states here. And then, by uh, and then add that to 3 times oxygen's entropy, which is 205.07. Once we put all of those numbers together, again, our predictions match the value that we get when we calculate. We get a positive 96.09 joules per Kelvin. Remember, again, you've got to multiply these entropy values by the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. So here we are proving with numbers that our predictions using the guidelines actually are correct. Now I want to take a, a look at a second way of determining um, the change in entropy of a system. And this particular method relates entropy changes to the spontaneity of a chemical reaction. So is a chemical process going to happen in a spontaneous way? And we can do that by looking at, we can predict that by looking at the second law of thermodynamics which states that a spontaneous process is one that results in an increase in the entropy of the universe. So that's a little heady, the universe, but there are some ways that we can break this down and figure it out. So the basic relationship we have is that the change in entropy of the universe is the sum of the change in entropy of the system and the change in entropy of the surroundings. So you take the system and the surroundings, you put those together, and that makes everything or the universe. This can also be uh, expressed as the standard entropy of the universe, the standard entropy of the system, and the standard entropy of the surroundings. Calculating the change in standard entropy of the system is easy. We just used that equation that I introduced a few slides ago, where the change in entropy of the system is equal to the standard entropy of the products minus the standard entropy of the reactants. And so in this case, we are looking at a reaction of the manufacturing of methanol from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And so our chemical reaction is carbon monoxide gas and two hydrogens producing methanol. And that's liquid methanol. And so, of course, if we look at the change in entropy of the system, it's going to be the standard entropy of the methanol minus the standard entropy of carbon monoxide, minus the standard entropy of hydrogen. Keep in mind we need to multiply by the coefficients. And when we do this calculation, we have one mole of methanol, we have one mole of carbon monoxide, and we have two moles of hydrogen. And when we put all those numbers together, keeping in mind that those values, the 127.2, the 197.7 and the 130.7 come from Appendix L in the back of your book. We actually get a negative value of negative 331.9 joules per Kelvin. So the entropy of the system is, is negative. Okay? But now that's not, that, that would indicate, that would suggest that this is not a spontaneous process. However, this is not the whole picture because this is just the change in entropy of the system. We have to look at the change in entropy of the surroundings, and it's the sum of those two that's going to give the change in entropy of the universe, which is what we really need to find in order to determine if the system, if this chemical change or physical change is going to be spontaneous or not. Calculating the change in entropy of the surroundings is a little bit more complex. 
because the change in entropy of the surroundings is calculated by taking the Q or the heat transferred in relationship to the surroundings divided by the temperature in Kelvin. So we can't measure the surroundings and this becomes a little bit of a problem, but keep in mind the rule about heat transfer. Whatever goes out of the system goes into the surroundings and that heat amount is going to be the same. So whatever energy is absorbed by the surroundings must be given off by the system. So we can express the entropy of the surroundings in terms of the heat of the system divided by the temperature in Kelvin. And that's where we come up with this relationship right here, where the change in entropy of the surroundings is equal to the negative of the change in enthalpy of the system divided by the temperature in Kelvin. So of course the change in enthalpy of the system, we can use the, our same familiar re relationship right here, just like we calculate entropy, we can use the standard heats of formation of the products minus the standard heats of formation of the reactants to get the change in enthalpy of the system. And then of course we have to take the negative of that to get the change in entropy of the surroundings. And again, we can look up these values in Appendix L. Keep in mind that enthalpies of formation of elements are zero. So here we have hydrogen and here we have zero. So those terms are usually just dropped out of the equation altogether because when you take something that's zero and you add it in, it doesn't change the number at all. So we have methanol, which is the heat of formation is negative 238.4, and we have carbon monoxide, and the heat of formation for that is negative 110.5. We subtract those two, and we get a negative 127.9. Now we have the change in entropy of the system, and we have the change in enthalpy of the system. Now we're going to try and put those together, okay? So we're, first we're going to take the change in enthalpy of the system and convert that into the change in entropy of the surroundings. So we're going to take the negative of negative 127.9 and we're going to divide it by 298, which is room temperature. And so we assume for most of these systems that we're calculating that the temperature is going to be 298 unless we're told something different. Now, one of the things that you've got to keep in mind here, look at the unit. Enthalpy is described in kilojoules. Entropy is described in joules. We can't put those together without having unit consistency. So what we do here is we're going to take the kilojoules and we're going to convert them to joules by multiplying by a thousand. Because we've got to have, when we're going to add the two together to get the change in entropy of the universe, we've got to have unit consistency. So we can convert kilojoules to joules or joules to kilojoules, but watch out and make sure your units are consistent. So negative 127.9, take the negative of that, divide it by 298, multiply it by 1,000, and we get a positive 429.2 joules per Kelvin. So now let's put this all together. We calculated the change in entropy of the system. We calculated the change in entropy of the surroundings. We're going to put those two together. And we have a negative 331.9 plus a positive 429.2. When you put those together, we get a positive 97.3 joules per Kelvin change in entropy of the universe. So indeed, the synthesis of methanol is a spontaneous process because we get a positive change in entropy of the universe. Now notice that we have two factors going into this decision about the spontaneity. One is the entropy change, and one is the enthalpy change. These can be put together in four different scenarios, and that's what's listed in this table right here. Type 1 is where the change in enthalpy is less than zero, so that means it's an exothermic process. 
the change in entropy is positive, so that means we're creating more disorder. And when you have this combination, these are both favorable. So exothermic and creating more disorder are both fav favorable. And so if you have those two in combination, that your chemical process will always be spontaneous under all conditions. Now, let me jump down to scenario four. We're going to go through these fairly quickly, and then I'm going to show you some, some examples of them. Type four is the opposite. You have an endothermic process where the delta H is positive, and you're creating more order, so the delta S is negative. When you have that combination, these processes are never going to be spontaneous, ne never ever going to be spontaneous under any conditions. Then, interestingly, the ones in the middle are the ones that are the most interesting, of course, because here you have favorability for enthalpy and entropy that are fighting against each other. One is favorable and one is not favorable. So scenario two, where you have an exothermic process, but you're creating more order. And interestingly enough, these, these of course, are going to depend on the relative magnitudes of delta H and delta S. These turn out to be more favorable at lower temperatures, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. And then scenario three, where you have enthalpy unfavored or disfavored, but you're creating less order. These also depend on the relative values of H and S. These are going to be more favorable at higher temperatures, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so for type one, an example of that would be a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions are always exothermic, and for the most part, vast majority of them produce large numbers of product molecules from small numbers of reactant molecules. And typically, those product molecules are gases, carbon dioxide and water. And because it's exothermic, it's water vapor that is typically produced. And so you get a lot of gas molecules from relatively few molecules that could be gases, but sometimes are also liquids or solids. So you would expect, based on the guidelines, for this to be a favored process and to be spontaneous. And of course, it, in this example, I'm not going to go through all the math steps and everything, but the delta H for this reaction, the combustion of butane, is a negative 5,315 kilojoules, and the change in entropy is a positive 312.4 joules per Kelvin. So then when we take all those numbers and combine them, just like we did in the previous slides, the change in entropy of the universe is a whopping positive 18,418 joules per Kelvin. So this is definitely a spontaneous process. Type 4, the synthesis of hydrazine, N2H4. It's endothermic with a positive 50.63 kilojoules per mole. And the entropy change is negative, so you're creating more order here. And it's a negative 331.4 joules per Kelvin because you're producing one mole of liquid, which is the hydrazine, from three moles of gases, from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. So when you calculate the change in entropy of the universe, you get a negative 499 joules per Kelvin. That's not going to be spontaneous because the change in entropy of the universe is negative. Okay, the type 2 example, the example we have here is the production of ammonia gas from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. It's exothermic, and there, um, it's favored by energy dispersal. Okay, so energy, when en and whenever energy can get spread out, that's a favorable situation. However, this is entropy unfavorable because you're taking four moles of gases and you're producing two moles of gases as the product. So if you go back and think about the fact that the entropy of the surroundings has that temperature involved in it. And this is also, think about this, a great way to think about this is Le Chatelier's principle. This is exothermic, right? So that means it produces heat. So if you think about it in terms of Le Chatelier, it's lower temperatures are going to make this reaction more favorable. Because if you raise the temperature 
it's like you're adding a product in this chemical reaction and it's going to drive the equilibrium back to the left. So you lower the temperature and the system wants to be driven to the right to produce energy or heat. So that's one of the reasons in terms of Le Chatelier that this type of reaction, this combination, is going to be more favorable at lower temperatures. Look at the type 3 example. This is the thermal decomposition of ammonium chloride. Ammonium chloride is a salt which we keep in the chemical storeroom and it lasts for years. It just sits on the shelf and lasts for years. It doesn't spontaneously decompose into ammonia and hydrochloric acid gas, fortunately, because that would be a huge disaster. This is an endothermic process. In other words, for it to decompose, you have to supply heat to the system. But it's entropy favored because you're producing two moles of gas from one mole of a solid. So ammonium chloride, fortunately for us, is stable as a solid at room temperature. But if you heat it up, it decomposes into ammonia gas and hydrochloric acid gas. Yuck! Don't want to have that happening. So let's do a little practice. And we have four different scenarios here where we have um, A is an exothermic reaction that is entropy disfavored. So this is going to be one of the ones that, because it's exothermic, this is going to be more favorable at lower temperatures. And this is a combustion reaction. And so that would be type that would be type 2. The second one is endothermic and entropy favored. So that would be like the type 3 one. The production of carbon dioxide is exothermic and entropy favored. So that would be like a type 1 and that would be spontaneous at all times. And then the last one is endothermic and entropy disfavored. And so that would be like a type 4, and that would never be spontaneous. So there you have it, kind of a summary of the different types of combinations of enthalpy and entropy, and how those relate to the spontaneity of chemical reactions.